Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and especially thank you also for to Thermo for organizing this symposium. Um, you know, I recognize something very funny. I've been to the BFR conference uh, last few days and I noticed that my hotel room number there at the Francis Drake Hotel would be 1614. So I don't know whether this means something to you. <laughs> Method 1614 for PBDE. Now I'm here having room number 1016, which is an arrow claw. So that's a really funny coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it makes it easy for me to have a starting point to discuss again something which is fairly old, PCBs as chemicals have been used since the 1920s, as far as I know. And since that time, they have been a constant problem for environmental contamination and um, human contamination, also causing even some health problems. I remember in the 1960s in Japan, some severe cases of contamination and even death due to PCB. Um, so I would like, first of all, to point out a little bit the history of GC analysis of PCBs, which started around the 1960s by having a PEC GC analysis at that time, which would result in uh, something like this, having a couple of signals for a very complex pattern. We count perhaps 10, 15 signals here, and quantification was done at that time by just comparing the pattern we got to the technical original pattern. So we took the technical mixture and just compared and saying, okay, that's it, that's PCB. This schedule has been refined in the, let's say, 1970s, 1980s by switching over to capillary GC and detecting with GC and also MS, uh, let's say, the real pattern. So we came up to a pattern with dozens of peaks, identifying also really the main constituents of um, the PCB, technical PCB patterns. Quantification was at that time, for routine work, for the main work, not for the real scientific work, um, reduced to quantifying only a couple of compounds as being representative. Well, it's representative. So usually we take six of the compounds, 28, 52, 101, 138, 153, 180, and saying, okay, these are the typical ones. So everybody would check for only those compounds being to a certain degree representative to all the technical patterns. But, of course, this is not really true because you see how complex the patterns are and uh, it is always a little bit different what you get in environmental samples, in metabolized samples, as for example, fish or human samples. So, well, that's not really the truth. In Germany, we even uh, switched over to multiplying the total of the six compounds times five, saying, okay, and now that's total PCB. Fairly semi-quantitative and uh, quite easy to reach approach, but nevertheless, it's not the truth. Then toxicity discussion came in the 1990s around uh, discovering that some of the PCBs would actually have um, dioxide-like activities, assigning TEF factors, toxic equivalent factors to those compounds. And um, along with that came additional, let's say, market activity by the producers of standards, providing us with all the standard solutions being necessary. But still, nobody would switch over to analyze really all of the compounds. But instead, we put up more, uh, um, we, we put up more activity in discussing limit values. For, at the moment, we do have a new evaluation uh, of EU limit values for food and feeds, but also only focusing upon the dioxin-like PCBs and on the six main compounds, markup PCBs. Well, that's not the end. In the last couple of years there has been a discussion especially here so we are right at the epicentrum of the last activities on that by having the proposition 65 of Californian uh, um, government defining a safe intake safe harbor level of PCBs coming from the human perspective saying okay it is safe to take in about 0.09 microgram per day 
expressed as total PCB. And so here we are, having up to now only some representative compounds being analyzed and the legal demand of total PCB. And that's where my starting point was, because that is, of course, something where we thought, OK, now let's do it the right way. Let's analyze them all. And we took as a baseline the EPA 1668 method, but we did not strictly follow it. We took another GC column for separation, for example. And that's what I will discuss next, discussing which samples we analyzed as a starting point for our activities and discussing what we did there to them. We took fish oil samples. Well, we are a commercial lab, so sometimes we cannot really choose what we get, but I was able to identify tuna and achovi as the fish being behind, and we took this as a starting project to run such an analysis, reporting on fat base, original base, it's the same for fish oil, and meanwhile also doing some analysis on other biota matrices, mainly marine oils or fish oils. I will show the results. What we did was, as I said, taking the EPA 1668 high resolution GC method as a baseline. Um, we are as a commercial lab based in Europe always looking to the EU reference methods quoted in EU legislation, but they are not that far away from EPA methods. We report usually total PCB, all 209. But to do so, of course, we analyze all GC peaks, we get all 209 from mono to deca, and just combining them in the end by calculating total mono, total D, total tree, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is done by the usual stuff, who is uh, used to dioxin analysis, will easily recognize, for example, silica alumina columns, here is a silica column with sulfuric acid silica at the top, I guess. Um, that's for preparation of the samples. Analysis, high resolution GCMS, thermal DFS, we did our main work there. Um, running uh, SGE HT8 PCB column for separation because that has been a GC column especially designed for separating as many compounds as possible. There we had a certain tricky problem, I will address this later on. Taking isotope dilution to, well, let's say a reasonable amount in terms of having 35 quantification standards employed from mono to deca also and having seven other standards as injection standards to check for recovery rates and performance. And also running all 209 native compounds in multipoint calibration. That was quite a task and it was really interesting to see how they behaved. And well, in fact, they behaved quite nice because uh, we did not have or quality of the system, uh, bigger issues at that. So linearity was pretty good starting from, I guess it was about 100 femtograms per microliter up to 400 picogram to microliter was really good. Um, quality data was all also reasonable. We established a range like having for the quantification standards uh, 40 to 130 percent as acceptable. EPA 1668 even gives us more uh, uh, room to that. But EU legislation for dioxins, for example, they would stick to figures like 60 to 120 percent. So that's a compromise, but it is a very achievable compromise because in terms of routine analysis of a broad range of compounds from one or two decachlorinate ones, uh, well, I would not have expected such a, a pretty good and, and uni unified performance throughout all the groups being at around, let's say, 70% recovery rates. You could do some more tuning, but in the end, I also have some other projects, sorry, so I stopped there saying, okay, it is reasonable just to have about 50 to 80% roughly as recovery ra rates for the quantification standards. What did we find? Something like this. First step, of course, is having Huge amounts of data, having big, big tables, and uh, to make them a little bit more convenient, uh, I, I set up some patterns like these. Um, but this is um, something, well, almost nobody would understand. And in the end, you will get 
typical patterns. This is a typical fish oil pattern, so you will have the stable and uh, persistent compounds like what is this? It's 100 and what can read it? 182, 187, it's a hepta. Here's a 180, one of the marker compounds is a 153, 138 present. So this is something which is quite usual for someone being very in-depth in PCB analysis. But for overview purposes and also for showing you something which is more, more better readable, um, I decided to co condense data down to the totals, even making some checks for the fish oils we had, whether they would um, fit into the scheme and then compared against the EFSA European Food Safety Authority data they reported in 2010 about um, levels of PCB and dioxin in mainly food samples and the data I got was very reasonable being with the TQ values, average median TQ values, well below uh, uh, the roughly uh, calculated data uh, from the EFSA. So that was okay because there is almost no reference data on totals of PCB congener groups or the total PCB itself. Anyway, what we got was something like this. This is fairly usual. Having a distribution in the fish oil being at maximum for hexa and heptachlorobifenyls, representing in the end what you get out after metabolism as being stable throughout the environment, throughout metabolism. And also it reflects to a certain degree mm, typical technical PCB pattern. So if I compare this also to, here we are, with the American Arrow curve 1260, I took the German Clofin A60, um, you will see that these are also products uh, mainly uh, consisting of hexa and heptachlorobifenyls. I cannot judge whether this is the main pattern. I guess the highly chlorinated PCB mixtures have been the ones being wide, the, used at the widest, at the widest. So it might also be that the stable, uh, metabologically stable congeners would just match uh, the PCB patterns with the highest manufacturing figures. In the end, it's pretty much the same for all of them. Um, I did some other work besides of these tuna and anchovy oils in the last time, and just to give you some comparison, here we have some shark liver oil, cod liver oil, and also a seal oil. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Seal. Um, showing pretty much the same. So we will end up in all the marine matrices with, let's say, penta to hepta, PCB mainly, uh, maximum at hexa, and hepta. Yeah, right. Differences there. Well, I'm not sure whether my tuna and anchovy oil won't be refined or processed oils, because on, on processing of raw fish oil, you might easily lose some congener groups. And if they distill the fish oil, you might get rid of the um, lower chlorinated compounds as well as of the dioxin-like PCBs with active carbon filtration, things like this. So this might be discussed that the profile itself varies depending on which fish, which trophic level, of course, you also have. Going farther, here we are with whale. I did analyze whale oil samples, in fact, and there you see that you might find things like pre tetra pentachlorobifenyls, which might be due to feeding. What are they feeding from? Unfortunately, I don't know which whales I exactly got, but feeding trophic level is indeed something very interesting here because. Uh, we did analyze also something else, being krill oil. And here we are with something special. What I did not recognize up to now, what I did not see up to now, having really dechlorinated and trechlorinated beef and wheels being at the maximum. And that's, well, something you might get if you filter the water. Krill is living from what? From just filtrating water? And I guess my, it might be due to water sol better water sol solubility sorry, of the D and 3 chlorobifenyls rather than going to the sediments. It should be discussed, perhaps another time. 
Yeah, difficulties. Having nice figures don't mean we would have a very easy analysis, besides of having about 180 signals to be evaluated. Huh? With high resolution MS, you always get something like uh, uh, FC5311 background signals from the calibration substance being, being present. So you would like to minimize your uh, calibration substance in the high resolution MS in order to uh, lower this level of interference. And that was the worst example here. By the way, you get it on all HR in the systems. You will also get it for the outer specs. So we saw it on both systems depending on the calibration substance you use, so for PFK you get pretty much the same interferences. But if you lower the levels uh, too far, you will run into problems because also cleanup is a problem for PCB analysis. And this problem with cleanup I demonstrate here. I've got a question for you. There is one PCB hidden. Where is it? Here is 126 as a standard, so it should be here at that line. What we actually get there are fragments from hexafluorobutanides from mass spectrometric technique, so they tend to fragment, and you will always see it, your analytical uh, process on your instrument signals, the chlorine loss fragments, in this case, from hexa to penta, or even from hepta to penta. So some other signals are uh, due to loss of two chlorine atoms from, in this case, it's 180, 180 PCB. Yeah? And the remaining compounds, interferences. Well, you might blame me for not refining the cleanup too much. You could easily get rid of them by applying active charcoal columns because 126 is a planar one, so you would easily uh, fractionate it from perhaps all the interferences. That's some work to be done still, but the main focus here was not to analyze dioxin-like PCBs especially. Huh? But here you should have only, if you would evaluate a little contribution of 126. And I already mentioned with the HD8 PCB column, we had some issues at the beginning because when we purchased the column, it did not show the elution order we expected. And having problems on supply with the column, we decided to start our project with this ordered column, having another elution order than on the normal HT8 PCB column. Well, we, uh, we worked things out pretty good, and uh, we compared the two column variations, having about the same number of separations, roughly 180 separations for all the PCBs. Um, we later heard that SGE would have had some problems on production of the column, which resulted in this different elution order. We also heard the opinion from Michael Oehm, it was, uh, that cold storage of the column might have affected it. Anyway, if you buy such a column, you will get the normal elution order, but Sadly enough, this is a very unique separation for PCBs, which is now lost because production has been refined at SGE. And the real profile also matters. So seeing, uh, I guess it was shark oil, PCB 52 we see here mainly in shark oil, that also affects the analytical performance because we judged at some time to combine congeners in, in, for reasons of quality, for reasons of always reporting the same coillusions, and it might be worth looking to these uh, uh, signals here. So we decided for practical reasons to report all those four together. These pairs, these couples, because we could not separate them, and these two together because in practical fish oil patterns we would have 65, 75 only being having the minor level, and it would be, um, um, so it would, from quality reasons, not be good to uh, trying to evaluate it. So we just combine, depending on, let's say, project demands, and depending on what we can reliably get with the system. My summary. 
Well, we did a fairly good job, I guess, having all those separations. Um, we can run the total PCB analysis in terms of having as many quantified peaks as possible, combining them in a decent way. We proved it for different fish oil samples, and we did it even under the hard conditions, having a GC column at our disposal with some altered or alternate features. Still, there are problems. Be careful in using PFK or PFC 5311. Uh, be careful, you will always have um, uh, interferences from the higher chlorinated PCB on your mass traces. And uh, be careful with mass spectrometry anyway, because you will end up in analyzing at the same time, let's say, three to Petra pentahexa chlorinated compounds, for example, at the same time. Or, in other words, analysis of 180 PCB instead of the 18, 12 WHO and 6 marker PCBs you will just have a great time having 10 times more trouble. And I guess that's the end. I would like to thank you for listening to me and I would also like to thank my two co-workers. She did a great job there. <laughs>